All these things we can link right back to stress and trying to do it all and being stretched thin. Um, this is the Wikipedia definition of simple woman. How many simple women in here do we have? <laughs> Yeah. 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 So when I read it, two things popped out at me. First thing is the use of the word exceptional. So not only do you have to be a woman, you have to be a woman with exceptional strength. Not only that, you have to successfully manage all these places that you manage, and then you become a superwoman. Guess what? It's not necessarily a compliment. You know, I think we, and, and now that the tide is kind of turning, I think we have been talking about the superwoman syndrome complex for the last couple of years, and, and people are becoming more open to the idea of doing things differently. But not too long ago, this was this may still to some be a compliment to be called a superwoman. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, you got, you got the house, you got the kids, you got the business, you got the pets, you got you know, you're managing all these things, you're taking care of your, your loved ones and degrees and PhD. You're doing it all. You're a superwoman. And most of the time, we would say. Yay, thank you. And we put a little super woman on our uh, hashtag. But um, it's not that great of a thing anymore. Uh, mostly because as a family doc, what I end up seeing, like I said, I see all these medical conditions. Never fails. Um, men, men have this you know, issue, the Superman complex too. But for women, we have, particularly working women, we have this unique conundrum. You know, we have to be, you mentioned code switching. We have to be this woman at work. We have to be this woman at home. This is our parents. This, 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 this. And we get confused and we forget who we really are. I, as the doctor, end up seeing the tears that come with the physical exams when I ask about well, how's your mood been? Are you sleeping? Are you happy? Rate your happiness on a scale from 0 to 10. You know, and then almost immediately the tears have come. Umbi has seen some of these <laughs> just this past week. Um, where we hold it together, we try to be strong for everyone, and then we have that vulnerable moment where we can actually let our, our guard down, the floodgates open. So I want to preach a ministry of giving women the permission to let, let things go, let their guard down, talk to one another, particularly in our professional settings, because again, we have to be this persona, we have to carry our letters on our chest, MD, PhD, postdoc, you know, we have to, to be all these things, but we're women, and we need support, we need rest, we need moments where we can just um, let our hair down and, and let go of some of the stress. So, my story, and how I got to this whole thing, so, um, as Kia mentioned, went to school here, graduated, I've been working in Durham ever since I finished residency, so, our practice, which was originally a UNC-owned practice in Durham, um, we were called Durham Family Practice at that time, met with the attendings that happened to work there, I said, hey, I just bought a house in Durham, I would love to stay in this area. He said, okay, well, we're not really looking for a physician, but come and um, see this brand new building that we're moving into, because I think it's cool when you live right down the street. Okay. So I went to see this brand new building, um, was interviewing and trying to find where I was going to practice, and um, at that time it was a married couple called uh, the two Dr. Benjamins, Dr. Chilla Curry, they were the three docs and a nurse practitioner, Eugene Fair. We're there. Um, so I'm the young, fresh new doc on the scene walking into the room. This is wonderful, this is beautiful. I wish I could work here. <laughs> and they're like, you know what? Maybe we do need another doc. <laughs> and that's how it happened, literally. Um, so God is good. So, you know, walked in and that was where um, I, you know, got my feet wet, became the new doc on the scene, and I've been there ever since. Over the course of about two or three years after that, seeing patients, loving it, drawing my panel, um, at that point, um, had met my husband, got married. UNC came down and said, eh, you know, this is a Duke run area, there are a lot of new practices, not a lot of money in, in this business for you all right now. Um, we were doing fairly well with the, you know, decade long career that we'd had in Durham, 10,000 plus patients seeing from babies to the grandparents, the whole family, but what wasn't really happening was the funnel of referrals of 15501 back to Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. That wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. Mostly because we serve a, a population that doesn't always have the money, doesn't always have transportation. Mm -hmm. If I can knock on my neighbor's door right around the corner, who's a cardiologist that can see my patient that day, mm -hmm. that's much more convenient than waiting a couple of weeks to a couple of months mm -hmm. to, uh -oh, to drive 
to Chapel Hill to see their specialist. And so it wasn't happening, logistically. <coughs> okay. um, and so they came to us and said, in six months, we're closing the doors. Like, uh, why'd you hire me in the first place? <laughs> like, I could have been working somewhere else. But um, when I think back, my father actually had a conversation with me. It, it could not have been three months before that happened to say, so what's your next move? I was like, what do you mean? I'm a new doctor. I'm making, I'm seeing these patients, and I just bought a house, and I'm good. I'm, everything's great. He was like, no, no. You need to start, you know, looking toward the next thing. What, what are you doing? What, you know, what's your goal? Okay. And then three months later, I <laughs> came down. So that taught me a lesson is, when it's time to move, move. Or God will move things for you. <laughs> That's my life lesson. But, um... So we, we essentially made the decision. We said, okay, we know nothing about business. We learned nothing about business school. Four docs together, we're going to make this happen. <laughs> that was crazy at that time. The UNC was like, okay, sure, yeah, have all your patients, bye. I don't like that. But we did it. We've been a private practice, independent practice for the last six, seven years, um, finally learning the ropes. Um, but clearly with all that, that comes the stress of now being a business owner. You know, that wasn't what I went to school to be. I went to school to be a doc. I want to be thrown into a, a thriving practice and see my patients and go home, but now all of a sudden I'm a business owner. So, graduated med school, new wife, now I'm a business owner, and a doctor, right? Baby number one comes. <laughs> happy, happy, joy, joy, she's healthy, loving it. Go back to work, I'm about eight, eight weeks postpartum, breastfeeding, not sleeping, seeing, you know, doing all the stuff we just do, because we just get up and do it. Um, talking to a patient, no big deal, typing on my laptop, getting up to leave the room, not a particularly stressful situation, she's doing well. Get up to walk out and I notice that my right arm is numb. I'm like, okay, so I must have been compressing it, I was talking for a long time, no big deal. I get up to walk her out, I hold the laptop in my right arm and I notice that the computer was starting to slip out of my hand. So I quickly um, ushered her out of the room. <laughs> 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 And um, my nurse looked at me and was like, are you okay? Who knows where the panic set is? I was actually having a stroke. Who knows what happened? But I felt like I couldn't, like my face, the right side of my face was drooping. And then slurred speech. And then I wanted to drop. So luckily she was right there. She caught me. I'm in the doctor's office, so everybody comes running. EKG machines, oxygen, everything comes running. <laughs> I pull my shirts being torn off. Um, five minutes later, I come to, no big deal, thankfully. Um, but clearly the next question is, well, are you sleeping? And are you, are you stressed out? How's your stress level? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm a mom. I'm like, I just had a baby. I'm back to work. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But, um, you know, did the whole thing, went through MRI. So I'm a neurologist, did my due diligence. I was a good patient. Um, they called my husband. He comes running with the baby, you know, <laughs> panic. Um, but it, what, it, what it did, and thank God it wasn't anything serious, but what it taught me or what it made me do was it made me sit down. It made me assess, it stopped me in my tracks, it made me look at my routine, how I was working, how I could get better sleep. It was something that made me stop in, our tra in my tracks. And that's usually what happens. Um, for some of us, unfortunately, it's something more major that happens that stops you and makes you reassess your situation. So what I want to tell women is to try to get ahead of that episode, whatever that episode may be, so that you can prevent <coughs> things kind of feeling like they're crumbling in on you. Okay, so that's how this whole superwoman thing came to be. I had an event. People brought information to me. Um, my father found this article in Newsweek about the superwoman, how women, because we are in the work field now, not only are we working at home, we're working outside of the home, and we have to balance those things, and how we're, we're getting burned out. We're suffering from mental Ill illness in ways that we never have. We're suffering from substance abuse in ways that we've never had. We're dying earlier, you know, for multiple reasons. And it's serious. You have to take it seriously. Particularly in the minority population. So there is the black superwoman syndrome. There was actually an article written in Ebony a couple of years ago when this whole superwoman idea was kind of peaking. So not only as minority women, women of color, do we have superwomen, <coughs> but on top of that being a woman of color. So now there's a whole nother layer of stuff that's on my back. And it, it comes from way back. So sociologists, psychologists, you know, they've studied this whole phenomenon. They think it has a lot to do with just the way that 
you know, our families were raised. Slavery, clearly, you know, men were taken from the home, so women had to wear the burden of being mom, of being provider, of being everything. And that should be carried through our, our, our culture. Um, but the question is, who's taking care of us? Yeah. Who's paying attention to us? It's not us, because we're focused on We also have this, you know, stereotypical phenomenon of keeping everything in the house. Don't, don't, don't tell my business. You know, we know Uncle Larry has some problems. We keep him in the back room. He's a Vietnam vet. We know, don't, we keep it, just don't tell anybody. We don't want to talk about it. He's probably schizophrenic, but we don't even know what that means. Just keep it back here. We know that Grandma is probably a little soft. Don't tell anybody. The Lord will handle it. Just pray. Just pray. Just go to church. Just go to church. And I'm, I'm a Christian, so I, yes, yeah. go to church. Yeah. <laughs> That's your thing. Yes, pray, but then put some faith into action. Do something with that. So then all these things are happening. Increased rates, depression, anxiety, so um, the, the whole idea, the superwoman idea, actually dates back to, there's a book written on the superwoman syndrome from the 1980s, where they started seeing in like the 50s and 60s, as more women entered the workforce, these things started happening. So this dates way back. But for, for some reason, it's coming up now. We're seeing it. This is a quote from the article that I like. The peculiar thing about doing the work to uplift others is the world often forgets that the worker also needs uplifting. Even more importantly, the worker forgets that the worker needs uplifting. So let's focus on that. Physician burnout. So we had some MDs, some postdocs, some med students. Physicians, and I'm not here to you know, tell a woe is me story and be sorry for me and all that stuff, but um, it's happening in higher rates purely for docs, particularly family docs, or pr primary care. So that includes family docs, pediatricians, internal medicine. I would throw um, anyone in the mental health field in that, in that group too, but we have higher burnout. Why? Um, I talked to you a little bit about the bureaucracy, the financial things that can happen with an office. So primary care, physician offices, people are quitting. People are doing something different. Insurance issues get in the way. We spend a lot of time having to, especially if you're in primary care, we, we spend a lot of time dealing with the mental health, the socioeconomic strain, the family and direct stressors. You know, not only do I have a patient sitting in front of me that needs help and or prescription, for something, some issue, but I have to consider, you know, who's going to take care of the child? Who's going to, who's, you know, can they afford this medicine? Um, do you have to make a decision between their pills or grocery shopping for the, for the month? I want them to go see a therapist for their insurance cover. You know, we have to consider all these things, and it's hard. Okay, it's hard in any field. We have to take care of people all day long, but particularly for primary care physicians. So people are leaving. They're burnt out. They're stressed. Or they're trying to continue doing these things, and um, they're not happy. They're not happy. Um, again, these are from my folks that are postdoc getting their uh, 